last Oops. night, Florida lost in stunning and heartbreaking fashion to Texas Tech, and urgency set in immediately in the aftermath for the Gators. Now, the number two overall seed faces an elimination game today at home in Gainesville, up against the two seed and top 10 ranked UConn Huskies. Welcome to the NCAA Baseball Regionals presented by Capital One. Winner plays tonight, loser goes home. This regional has been outstanding. And yesterday, UConn faced elimination against Florida A&M, but they stayed alive because slugger Ben Huber hammered the Huskies to a win over the Rattlers. He is an exit velo machine. Then in the nightcap, Gators and Red Raiders and Gavin Cash crush a pair of home runs in a back and forth affair that had a little bit of everything and then some as Texas Tech topped the Gators to get to the regional final tonight. And so now it's an elimination game here right now at Condren Ballpark. And then the winner plays again tonight at six against the Red Raiders. With that, we say hello and thanks for joining us in Gainesville. He's Xavier Scruggs. I'm Mike Monaco and X. It is do or die for the Gators, and this offense has been quiet in two games. Yeah, it's plain and simple. The offense has to find a way to string some hits together. This is an offense that scored 8.3 runs per game during the regular season, and they've been held to three in the first game and four in the second. They've got to do a better job with their approach. Don't have so much pressure on themselves. Don't feel like you have to hit the big three-run home run. Get some traffic on the bases going. Going up against UConn, who meanwhile lost its first game here on Friday to Texas Tech. And in the aftermath in the team huddle, head coach Jim Penders told him we're going to have to do it the hard way. And he told them about his 2011 team, which had George Springer and Matt Barnes, a couple of big league all-stars who they lost their first game in Clemson. They won it, and they went to the Super Regionals anyway. Yeah, there's experience, right? Coach Penders has been here before, and I think that story resonates with this team just because you're in that situation. Now it's about the big dogs coming through. A lot of relief pitchers might be coming to that bullpen. They've got to have their best game today. We have had four games here in Gainesville so far. They've been decided by a total of eight runs. Across the country, seasons ended yesterday. Emotion hovers thick today. The road to Omaha ramps up on this Sunday. The NCAA Baseball Regionals are presented by Capital One. What's in your wallets? What's at stake today? Win or go home? Loser is eliminated a season over and for Florida and head coach Kevin O'Sullivan trying to push out of this loser's bracket now and get to a Super Regional for the first time since 2018. Meanwhile, UConn, a team that went to Supers last year, X, you saw them. They've got the best offense in the Big East, and Ben Huber was hammering yesterday. Yeah, well, the big dogs got to eat, right? Elimination game, you mentioned somebody's going back to the crib. Ben Huber, he's the definition of a big dog. He's already had the most offensive production for this team so far. We'll see if he continues it today. They face Hurston Waldrop, junior right-hander from Georgia. First year with the Gators after transferring from Southern Miss. Kylie McDaniel's got him number 26 in his MLB draft rankings. Absolutely disgusting stuff. You're talking about one of the best arms in the nation. You see the strikeouts, 117 in just 78 in the third innings. Be aware of the three-pitch power mix, MLB power mix. I don't say that very often. He's got that type of stuff, the split. Will it be on today? That thing has some nasty drop to it. His catcher, B.T. Ryapel, told us it's the most electric stuff I've ever seen, caught, or hit against. That's who the Gators turn to today after going Jack Caglione in a game one win, Brandon Sprout in a game two loss, and they face UConn. David Smith, the captain for the Huskies, climbs in, and it's 97 out of the shoot, and off we go in Gainesville. Huskies put up nine runs on Florida A&M yesterday. That game was tied 5-5 after five innings and then into the eighth when the Huskies put up three runs, including a Huber home run. And we talked about it yesterday. Can UConn get early offense? That's something that has dried up a little bit for them recently, despite how great the offense has been all year. Smith's ahead in the count, three and one. Can they get to Waldrop early? 
or does he settle in with that power arsenal? 98 and a full count. And the one thing with Waldrop is he's got such a repeatable delivery, does a good job being able to throw the ball to both sides. We mentioned the mix. He's able to use everything on every side of the plate. See that fastball? It's electric. Just outside with 97. And David Smith works a leadoff walk. He talked about the electricity and the power mix. His overall whiff rate is 39%. The best by any major league starting pitcher this year is, no surprise, Jacob deGrom at 42%. The MLB average whiff rate for any pitcher, for reference, is 25%. So Waldrop's getting about 40% whiffs on all the swings against him. This is some contact from Paul Tamero, and it's a pop-up to the mound. And the last moment, Cade Curlin's got it for the first down. And the stuff is elite. And in your third game, that's who you trot out in an elimination game. Well, yeah, it just tells you about the depth of Florida's pitching staff, right? And Coach O'Sullivan talked after the game and mentioned if we've got to win one game at a time, obviously, but they have the pitching to get to where they need to be. This is one of the deepest pitching staffs in all of the nation. Now Dom Freeberger. First pitch swinging on a line to right at Ty Evans. Who draws a start today. No Michael Robertson, so Wyatt Lankford's in center. And a line drive out for out number two. All right, well, it brings up Ben Huber. He had a double that came off his bat at 114 miles an hour yesterday. Then in the eighth inning, that home run we mentioned, 427 feet. David Smith swipes second. Came into this regional with 38 stolen bases, tied for fourth in the country. Yeah, Smith doing a great job of getting the jump. You see him not hesitate. He's able to get that bag easy in scoring position now for Ben Huber. The fifth year senior first baseman, first team Big East. Fastball grabs the corner. Jim Penders, his head coach, said post game, we wouldn't be here without number 44. Couldn't hold up. And Waldrip knows it, talks about it, and struts. It's a zero for Hurst and Waldrip. Gators against Garrett Coe when we come back. Seeds eliminated. Oklahoma State and Auburn are done before games even get started on Sunday. You check out the national seeds facing elimination, including the Gators serving as the home team here against UConn. And some lineup changes. We told you Wyatt Langford to center. Jack Caglione homered against Texas Tech last night. 29 now for Caglione. Just absolute ridiculous power coming off the bat of Caglione. He's going to be an important piece today, but they've got to get guys on in front of him in order for him to do some work. The same thing for Langford. Fourth year junior left-hander Garrett Coe toes the slab, a native of Lakeside, Connecticut, making his seventh start of the season with a 4-0-1 ERA in about 50 or so innings this season. Not overpowering, but this guy craves the pressure moments. Uh, yeah, the big burly lefties done a nice job of coming up in these big type of situations. You'll see the fastball normally around 85 to 90, but really uses that changeup. He relies on that a lot. He's, he's got to get the weak contact. You see, must command this two-pitch mix. It, it's not going to be a, a big arsenal. It's going to be fastball changeup. He'll cut the fastball or cut the changeup every now and then. That'll give hitters a different look. 3-1 is high, and it's a walk from Garrett Coe. Derek Coe, six foot six, 256 pounds. Jim Penders was telling his pregame down on the field that 
of everyone on their pitching staff, he trusts that Coe is probably the one guy or the guy who is least likely to have any fear on this stage. Here's Wyatt Langford. First pitch swinging. Langford in the air toward the line and left, and Corey Morton hangs with it. One pitch, one out on Langford. Well, you mentioned not having fear for Garrett Coe. This is a situation in which guys can feel some pressure, right? You understand your season is on the line today specifically, but at the same time, it's one game at a time, right? One pitch at a time. You can't overbear yourself, can't be overwhelmed in that type of situation. Look at these descriptors as he feels up high to Jack Caglione. For Garrett Coe, Jim Penders told us coming here, uh, he's a Shrek-looking guy. His teammate, one of his closest friends, Stephen Quigley, said he looks like a lumberjack. And his pitching coach, Josh McDonald, said, our tough guy. He hits Caglione. And not tough in the sense looking for a fight, but again to the pressure that he would thrive, they thought, in an atmosphere like this. However, it's a walk and a hit batter for him here in the first. Well, if you're Florida's offense, this is what you're looking for to most, is being able to get guys on base, provide some more traffic for guys in the middle of the order like Josh Rivera. The stud fourth-year shortstop takes a change for strike one. Kevin O'Sullivan said post-game last night after the loss, 5-4 to Texas Tech, we just didn't have our best at-bats at the most crucial times. That's been the case the first two games for the Gators. Kozo won. So change up fastball to start out. And what Coach O'Sullivan means by that is, is staying disciplined and sticking to our plan during those types of moments when we can drive runners in, when we can have some better ABs. Those, that has to be a priority today, especially with runners in scoring position. 0-2 to Rivera. Who had a two-run homer Friday against FAMU in the first inning. Pulled it through the wind and came off his bat at 111 miles an hour. Oh, 2 Josh told us post-game Friday that after the way last year ended, game seven of a regional here against Oklahoma, that he kept walking around last year telling everyone, we'll be back, and I'll be back to lead this team. Told us we just have to take it one step at a time. 1-2. It sounds so cliche, but that's the focus today, right? You can't think too far out in front. Otherwise, you put extra pressure on yourself. I've got to control what I can control today, and that is one pitch at a time, making good swing decisions, taking care of the little details. Those things will be magnified in this elimination game today. UConn already played in one yesterday. One, two. Cut on and miss. Good change from Coe for out number two. And what's going to set up that changeup that was so good right there is that fastball on the inner half of the plate. Garrett Coe has to continue to attack and establish the fastball on the inner half. He hit Caglione doing that, trying to come on the inner half, but he's got to continue to attack because he doesn't have the velocity to beat them with the fastball. So he's got to set it up, the changeup. Here's BT Ryapel. Catcher for Florida in the five spot in the lineup. Fifth year senior who's 0 for 8 so far. Four strikeouts in these first couple of games. But 13 home runs coming here, and you see the 60 driven in. Three home runs and 10 RBIs in Hoover at the SEC tournament. Kozo one. Popped up foul, nothing in two. I mean, we're talking about 99% of the pitches are these two. Yeah, it's a, it's a two-pitch mix, so you have to be that much more precise when it comes to where you're throwing it, right? Being able to stick to the corners. You're not going to be able to change different speeds, different arsenals that much, so you got to be really precise with where it's coming out at. Up the ladder for a strikeout. 
Jim Penders told us Komai top out at 89. Reached back for 90. Back to back K's in the first. Top two in the Gainesville Regional, the number two overall seed, Florida against UConn. Well, we are two days into regional action across the country, and how about a couple of four seeds who are already in regional finals? Penn, no Ivy League team has ever been to the Super Regionals since that format started back in 99. And Oral Bobby, 20 game winning streak now for Oral Roberts. And uh, Tennessee and Clemson played a classic at Doug Kingsmore Stadium last night. Jake Studley pops up the first pitch in the second from Hurston Waldrip to Josh Rivera for the first down. Mike, seeing those four seeds get the opportunity to, you know, get to the final game, right, or get to a game to allow them to get to a Super Regional, it reminds you that baseball is crazy like that, right? And it got, any team can win on any given day if they bring their best A game. That's, that's what I love about this game. We've only had seven four seeds who have reached Super Regionals. And we got two who are one win away. One down, Luke Broadhurst, the DH, the batter for the Huskies. Wake Forest, the number one overall seed. They're in a regional final as well. They started their game at almost 11 p.m. Eastern time yesterday. Broadhurst to third. Another start for Colby Halter. Two down. Wake Forest to the Grand Slam at 1.53 a.m. Part of 21 runs they put up against Maryland. That's that late night swinging. Were you up? <laughs> Your boy was sawing, sawing Z's. I was all knocked out. <laughs> two down for Waldrop. Here's Ryan Daniels. Freshman who has started now two games in a row after he came off the bench in the opener. Brian Padilla, the shortstop, coming off the bench. Paul Tamaro's gone from second to short for the Huskies. And the confident rookie from Meriden, Connecticut, in the lineup for Jim Penders. On the edge, nothing at two. Waldrop, like Sprout and Caglione, works quickly. His 0-2. Waldrop looking for a good start. Last six outings going back more than a month. It's a 6-1-5 ERA. That's back to the South Carolina series. Last time out for Hurston Waldrop was Wednesday of last week at the SEC tournament against Alabama. Five and two thirds, three runs, seven strikeouts. He was on short rest. Wanted to keep him in the 80s with his pitch count, and they did. One, two. One thing as a hitter facing a guy like Waldrop who has such a great split that dives down in the zone with two strikes, that's one of the pitches you gotta think. I gotta stay away from something down. I gotta get it up. It's a fastball down, not the split. And Which at the same filthy. time, it, it makes it tough because if I'm saying I need to get something more up in the zone, I might get a fastball that looks like it's rising and then it gets out of the zone and gets on me quick. So it, it's almost like it gotta minimize my mistakes up in the zone and down in the zone. In the dirt, Daniel swings through it. Ryapel caps the K. Back-to-back 11-pitch -back innings for Hurston Waldrip. No blood yet in the second. UConn last year won the College Park Regional. They went to Supers. They beat Stanford in game one, but the Cardinal responded with back-to-back -back wins to knock out the Huskies. And Jim Penders said, our team watched Stanford celebrate and dogpile, and it was like castor oil taking our medicine, and you were there for it, X. Yeah, I had the opportunity to call those games, and, and really, you know, UConn had such a solid team. They had a great pitching staff. They fought, and, and honestly, it was tough watching them watch Stanford celebrate, but it reminded you of all that they had been through throughout the course of that season, and they, they soaked it in, and they knew that they had the opportunity. They were that close to get to the College World Series. 2-0 on Luke Hayman, the DH in the sixth spot. Freshman takes a strike. You asked Ben Huber, who's on that team, yesterday about it, and he said, we've been thinking about that and taking that with us all year since it happened. 
said we knew how close we were and knowing how difficult that was on our goal of getting to Omaha. 3-1 to Heyman. Opposite way. Great piece of hitting from the freshman. Bounces it to the wall. Studley picks it up and won't get him. Lead-off double for Luke Heyman in the second. Well, these are some of the at-bats that Florida is looking more towards today and that they haven't had as much of over the past couple of days. It's just a 3-1. You're ahead in the count. I'm going to take you off. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to pull even though I'm ahead in the count. I'm going to take what the pitcher gives me, drive something to the opposite field, finds himself in scoring position with no outs. Heyman's four for nine. A couple of doubles here in his first taste of regionals. Now Tyler Shelnut first pitch swinging to right center. And David Smith there for the first out as Heyman tags and moves up 90. Productive out from Shelnut. Yeah, you mentioned productive out. You can tell the approach. I'm trying to go to the opposite field. I'm looking to move the runner over. If I can go to the right side of second base, I, I want to try to get this ball on the ground. But if it's up enough to where I can drive it, I'll take that, of course, and get it deep enough to where I can get the sacrifice fly. Now left on left for Garrett Coe against Colby Halter, who's hit by the pitch. A leaking fastball, and it's the second hit batter from Garrett Coe in two innings. So they are at the corners, and it brings up the nine man, the right fielder, Ty Evans, into the starting lineup. Hasn't been a regular since April in the South Carolina series, so well over a month. Starter for a lot of this season. His last hit was April 11th. Ofer's last 16. Talented sophomore from Auburndale, Florida. And Kevin O'Sullivan gives him the nod over Michael Robertson here today. 2 and up. Yeah, Coast fastball running a little arm side right now. He's got to get back to repeating his delivery, getting out in front being able to stay down in the zone. 2-0 pitch. Popped up, foul ground, and Ben Huber watches that one get off beyond the berm. A few spots of lineup uncertainty for the Gators at the bottom of their lineup. Kevin O'Sullivan mixing and matching here these first few days of regionals. Elevated heater. At the corners, one out in the second. Coe's 2-2. Two -two. Evans strikes out. Garrett Coe has come up with three huge strikeouts already. Yeah, a really nice job there with the changeup. Maybe a little more up than he wanted it, but I like it because it's off the plate. He expanded the zone with the two strikes. Really good spot right there. Back to the top for the freshman second baseman for the Gators, Cade Curlin. Walked his first time. No pitch. Two balls and no strikes on Curlin with Wyatt Langford next. And Curlin's got to be selective here. Runners on first and third. I don't think you'll see any type of action. They're going to let Curlin hit, but it's got to be selective. Way ahead in the count. Matt Garbowski visits. Coe's had his walks this year, 25 of them in 51 and two-thirds coming in. And it's 3-0 with that guy next. Yeah, and I want Langford up with bases loaded. If I can, if I can give Curlin the take here, I think that's what you got to do. See if 
Cole's going to throw a strike. Make him throw a strike. He doesn't. Loaded for Lankford. Two walks, two hit batters in two innings, and a second trip to the plate for the Trenton Thunder. Wyatt Lankford. The command is getting a little bit away from Cole. He's got to get back toward the inner half of the, the right-handed batter's box. Lankford flew to left. First pitch swinging down the line, and he pulled it foul. 104 off the bat. A little out in front of the change up there. And Coe's job here, as well as Garbowski, is to try to figure out what is Langford sitting on? What is he looking for? Let's make sure we're changing speeds and not giving him what he's sitting on. It's a change up to start. Now it's a fastball that grabs the upper corner of the zone to make it nothing and two. And if you're Coe, now you can expand, right? You can't offer anything toward the middle of the zone. You got to see if you'll get him to swing and miss on something outside of the zone here with two strikes, way ahead in the count. 0-2. Oh, Doesn't expand that high. And a lot of times, you go eye-level fastball to come back to that changeup. Langford knows that. He's a smart hitter, so it's got to be down in the zone. It's got to be one of those swing and miss pitches, maybe in the dirt. Galbowski would have to block something up, box it up. Loaded with two outs. 1-2. High and tight. Langford's been so impressive with his pitch recognition. Co v Langford. 2 2. Full count with the bases juiced. We're sticking with that fastball with two strikes. Thinking Langford might be sitting on that change. If he's going to go fastball, he's got to get good location here. Obviously, don't want to walk in a run. 3-2. Popped up behind home plate. Went change. And it tells you how much confidence he has in it, right? 3-2 bases loaded, two outs. He knows the situation. He knows who's up. Langford is a little bit on that changeup. I, I might stick with that fastball. Go up with it? I might try to elevate a little bit, yeah. Langford has laid off those in this at bat. 40th pitch of the day for Coe is down. Florida draws first blood. Absolutely amazing at bat right there by Langford. Didn't deviate from his approach or his plan whatsoever. You saw him pull the first changeup, was a little bit out in front, was still sitting changeup and making good decisions on the fastball up. Ultimately saw a fastball down for a ball to get himself over to first in the first run of the game. Jack Caglione. First pitch swinging. Left center field and Smith is back with room. Second day in a row, Caglione has just missed one to that spot with the bases full of Gators. ESPN's the home for the NCAA College Baseball Regionals and for around-the-clock multi-game coverage. Scan that QR code in the bottom left of your screen and on ESPN Plus, subscribers can access expanded coverage with squeeze play. It'll wrap up at 1 o'clock Eastern time. With Chris Budden and Mike Rooney starting it off. Chris Burke, pastel jacket and all, he'll jump in. Great Burke, he was fired up. Raving about Wyatt Langford when we were texting this morning. And how good Wyatt Langford is. You saw that there. You were mighty impressed with that plate appearance as well. And he's got the Gators out to a 1-0 lead after that bases loaded walk as we go to the third. 8-9-1, this is the catcher, Matt Garbowski. 2-0 from Hurston Waldron. Garbowski won for three with a walk yesterday, a double in the fourth, also got hit by a pitch 
Got on three times. Native of New Fairfield, Connecticut. Majority of the starts. Huskies have also used Ryan Hyde behind the plate. A couple of unsung guys on this UConn team. Garbowski a little out in front of that heater there. They might want to go off speed just to see if he's overly aggressive on the fastball. 2-2. Two -two. Fastball again, bounce to Curlin. One down. It's a veteran UConn lineup that we told you was the best in the Big East. Eight runs per game. They stole a ton of bases because the guys like Corey Morton saw his Jets and his effectiveness in yesterday's win for UConn against FAMU. He can run and so can the leadoff man, David Smith, who already stole the bag back in the first. Well, in that eighth inning yesterday, that was really impressive. His walk, it was tied ball game 5-5. Five, five. That walk allowed him to get on base, stole second. They moved him over, and then they did the safety squeeze, so using his legs. And now he pulls one in the left. Tyler Shellnut cuts it off. Morton tests him anyway, and he's got a double. Here with one out for UConn and the first Husky hit against Hurston Waldrop. Well, this is one thing, and, and even last year, I remember talking so much about Morton's skills. Just there's a power-speed combination, one of the fastest dudes that you'll see run the bases. He's busting out the box, thinking two immediately after that ball's hit. That's the type of intelligence you want to see continue from him and the aggressiveness as he allows his tools to come into play. He's had a hit in each game here at the regionals for UConn, and now goes back to the top for his teammate David Smith. Ran it full and walked against Waldrop in the first. Takes strike one. Smith, the captain, second team Big East this year. Third year at UConn, second playing for the Huskies after originally beginning his career at LaSalle. You look at the top six in this UConn lineup, and it's transfers everywhere. None of them from a power conference program either. That's how Jim Penders and his staff have built this roster. Bounced in. DT Ryapel blocks it. Well, he's also built it by guys that understand team aspect, right? And I think with Smith, he's so good at handling the bat. You've seen him be able to move runners easily. We talked a lot about that eighth inning yesterday in the tied ball game. Morton on second. Smith is able to move him over with the ground ball to the right side. So being able to handle the bat is one of his best attributes. Piles it off two and two. He can handle the bat. So can so many of the veterans behind him. Again, this is the top six and where Jim Penders got these guys from. Not Florida and Vanderbilt. Popped up behind home plate in our direction. And Mike, I think that speaks a lot to Coach Pender's ability to develop these types of players, right? Because yeah. bringing them over is, is not the, the tough part. The tough part is having them contribute in a way where they can provide production every single day or some type of consistency. 2-2. Two -two. Smith bounces it past Waldrip into center field. Morton can blaze, and this game is tied. David Smith's done that three times now here at the NCAA tournament. A roller in the center to get a run home. Well, his bat-to-ball skills are so elite. That's one thing that stuck out all season long. Goes down and gets the baseball, uses his legs with good balance. He's a little out in front, but still able to let the ball travel enough to get barrel on it. 65 mile an hour exit velo. Doesn't matter how you do it. Just place it. Put it where they ain't. One one hour score in the third. Paul Tamaro now. Popped the second his first half. Laces one foul. Paul Tamaro is one of the great stories we've seen down the stretch across college baseball. We showed you Oswego State. He was a four year starter there in the D3 ranks and then wasn't in the UConn lineup until down the stretch. 
pulled a hammy in the fall, the first day of fall practice for the Huskies in the 60-yard dash. So UConn didn't get a great look at him in the fall. Then when they did in the preseason, he hit like 230, 235. And that's kind of what they thought he was coming in. Maybe a defensive sub who could run. Really steady, well-rounded, but wasn't going to be massive with the bat. Well, he has been recently. He had their best OPS in a small sample this season. Strikes out on a slider from Waltrip. Two down. Seems like that slider's been pretty good from first and Waldrop early. His second time through the lineup, and now he gets Dominic Freeberger again. The UNC Asheville transfer. What a player Freeberger's been. Baltimore native. There's not a lot of grad programs at UNC Asheville, he was telling us, so he knew even ahead of his senior season in Asheville that he would transfer elsewhere for a fifth year. A self-described late bloomer. He told us in high school he didn't even start until his senior year. Wow. Didn't make varsity until his junior year of high school. And yep, ended up being Big East Player of the Year. That's a strike. He went to a camp at UConn in high school. Realized he wasn't quite at that caliber yet. Nothing in two. Well, those types of stories always remind me that everybody develops in different times, right? It's hard because you it's a comparable game, right? We always want to look at other players and see where we compare. But honestly, everybody's on a different path. And guys sometimes just shoot up or, or start using their skills differently than others at different times. So when Jim Penders tried to get him in the transfer process, Jim Penders said to Dom Freeberger, I'm sorry for not recruiting you the first time around. And Dom said, you have nothing to be sorry about. I wasn't good enough for you guys. Mm -hmm. I think that speaks to the character of both those guys. Yeah, and self-evaluation, right? Understanding that you know, if, if I want to get to a certain level, I've got to start doing things in a different manner. I've got to put myself in a position to make weaknesses strengths. That way I can give myself an opportunity. Runner goes and Freeberger strikes out. Waldrop's had that put away pitch going in his first three innings. We're locked at one. Kevin O'Sullivan and the Gators with their backs against the wall. He's with us right after this. You know, we, we know his fastball change up, and when he has to make a pitch, he's probably going to slow the ball down. But we've, we've been patient. We haven't chased out his own very much, which uh, got us a couple runners on, and obviously we got to walk with Wyatt up. So, um, yeah, the, the, the field's playing really big today, obviously. The ball jack hit probably goes out most days, but uh, we're going to have to manufacture some runs today. Coach, thanks a lot for the time. Thank you. Yeah, the ball Jack Caglione hit came off Caglione's bat at 111 miles an hour. Bases loaded, fly out just toward the track even, not up against the wall. This kind of feels like how the park played on Friday, day yes. one here. Yep. It's coming in. Josh Rivera against Garrett Coe, and Rivera squares one up to center. Smith to the first down. That was 109 off Rivera's bat, so case in point. And Garrett Coe's going to use it to his advantage, right? Those balls hit in the air. And I think that's the one thing. You're not going to get a ton of ground balls with Garrett Coe. These guys are going to try to elevate him, get something that they can drive. But at the same time, you know, if you're able to get some weaker contact, keep guys off balance, that's going to be huge for him. BT Ryapel might have seen a, a slider there, or at least a change up that might have had some cut to it. Ryapel pops to Tamero, and there's two down. It's interesting, too, because Garrett Coe's brother, Chandler, is a Texas Tech commit. Got that information from Joe McCoy, who's producing the Stanford Regional. And he's supposed to be about the same size as a pitcher and a shortstop. So large-bodied? Large-bodied. Guess he was a three-sport three athlete. 
possibly could have been D1 tight end. I'm talking about some athletic build in that co-family. And Jim Penders was telling us pregame, as Luke Heyman has a chat, that Garrett Coe is really athletic. That yeah, he's six foot six, 256 pounds, but he's a good athlete in there. They trust him making plays off the mound. Two outs on four pitches for the southpaw here in the third. Lou Kamen, a number to short, and Tamero makes it a five pitch inning for Co. That is massive. Double-A Baseball Regionals presented by Capital One. An elimination game in Gainesville. Yep, that includes the Gators. That's the Xavier Scruggs hairdo. This is <laughs> Rebels for UNLV. <laughs> hey, I'm not going to lie. Like, if you have the confidence enough to get that tatted and then show it off with the mohawk, like, all the respect to you. That's how you know you're all, all in, right? You bought all the way in. It's amazing. What are we setting the odds at that that's permanent ink? I mean, is that 20%? a sticker? 15%? I thought it looked real. It does. Ben Huber bounces one up the middle into center field, a base hit. Huber keeps on hitting. Lead-off base runner for the Huskies in the fourth off uh, Hurston Waldrop. Well, Huber's always going to give himself a chance because his balls are hit so hard. When you hit balls routinely 100 miles an hour and are doing it consistently, you're going to give yourself an opportunity to find a hole. Already four for nine in this regional. And you see the exit velos from yesterday. Absolutely scalded baseballs. We were talking about Huber with Jim Pender's pregame down on the field, and he said, look, someone's going to take a chance on Corey Morton in the draft because of his tools. Why wouldn't you take a chance on Ben Huber with that tool and that contact? Studley lifts this to center, and Wyatt Langford runs it down. Because if you can hit a 114, and Huber's been even higher than that at times this season, Jim Pender's told us he's had one or two over 120 over the course of this season. Wouldn't you want to take a chance on that? Absolutely. That's one of those ways that you know somebody can swing it well with the wood, right? And, I, and I've also liked his pitch selection throughout the course of the season. Really good job of getting on base, 437 clip. Makes good decisions at the plate. The, the approach has gotten better over the past couple of years. And his ability to hit with runners in scoring position. He's on for Luke Broadhurst with one out in the fourth in a 1-1 game. Winner plays again tonight, 6 o'clock against Texas Tech, and the loser goes home. Two and one on Broadhurst, second team Big East choice. Started his career with the Huskies, then went to D3 and came back to UConn. I'm talking with David Smith, his teammate. And David Smith said, look, there were some rumors around this time last year that Broadhurst was coming back. And he told us Broadhurst came back with a chip on his shoulder. Has not been coming back for some farewell tour. And he'll be back next year, too. That's a strike at the bottom of the zone. The splitter is working for Hurston Waldrop. And it's so tough to make the decision to swing because it starts off looking like a ball and then it just comes right over the plate. That's an amazing spot right there. Keeping them guessing. 
I showed you the numbers earlier on the splitter. It gets a super high chase rate and an absurd whiff rate. Ryan Daniels takes a heater. The whiff rate is 65% on the splitter for Hurst and Waldrop. Two thirds of the swings you come up empty on. Daniels vaults this one down the right field line. Ty Evans chases, but it's onto the berm. Well, Mike, that's the only way you end up getting 117 strikeouts over the season in 78 innings is your ability to have such swing and miss stuff. And we talked about the power mix. The slider's the same thing. Fastball gets up there 99. So the, the stuff is real. And it makes it tough as a hitter because I got to try to pick, pick one out. Daniels the opposite way past the dive of Rivera. Good swing from the freshman, and there's two on for the Huskies with two out. And that's how you do it right there. Staying short, compact. First hit of the regional. Going the other way, using the whole field. So Daniels on, Huber to second. Now Matt Garbowski, the catcher who grounded to Curland at second his first time. The bats have gotten better over these last few weeks from Matt Garbowski. Jim Penders told us he turned the corner the last month. Been hitting at a good clip. Squibber to first. Caglione flips. Waldrop strands two. Jim Penders is with us when we come back in the fourth in this elimination game, locked in one. Coach, uh, you're on this stage, and you knew Garrett Coe would be built for moments like this. What have you seen from him? You know what, guys? I can't hear you. How about now, Coach? You I got, got you us? now, yeah. Uh, Yeah, you know, the, the moment's not too big. I just, I, I'm hoping that he can get ahead a little bit more. You know, he's going to have to live on the corners. You know, he's been up and down, and he, that's part of what he does. But he's going to miss every so often. I mean, he's going to walk a couple. But, um, you know, he, he's just got a slow heartbeat. He's able to stay in this game. I mean, like I said to you guys, he bounces at a bar on campus for his part-time job. Uh, he's seen it all at 1.30 in the morning, 2 a.m. I mean, I'm not worried about him, him uh, the game speeding up on him. Coach, talk to us about the approach facing one of the better arms in the nation in, in Hurston Waldrop. What, what do you kind of go in telling your guys? Oh, he's elite, you know, and I said if, if we're going to go in with trying to uppercut and roundhouse and, and go with right and left hooks, it's going to be a long day. We have to go jabs. You know, you got to stay short and, and uh, just a lot, of, a lot of jabs. I like the way we're swinging the bat. We're hitting the fastball. That split change is filthy, though. Mm. Real quick, Coach, is he actually a, a bouncer? Yeah, he is. Doesn't he look like one? <laughs> he looks like one for yeah. sure. <laughs> All right, thanks. Appreciate thanks, you, guys. Coach. I know we hadn't learned that yet in our advanced scouting. <laughs> that wasn't in the report. I mean, talk about burying the lead, as they call it in journalism. That is the first sentence of the feature story in the in-depth profile on Garrett Coe. We're happy to have it, even if it's in the fourth inning. Absolutely. Part-time job as a bouncer on campus in Storrs, Connecticut, and pitching against the number two team in the country. Ooh, that is just down. He said he wanted Garrett Coe to get ahead. Well, he fell behind the seven-hole hitter for the Gators, Tyler Shelnut, and it's a leadoff walk. Part-time bouncer trying to bounce the number two ranked team in the nation today. Yeah. Fourth walk, plus two hit batters. But Garrett Coe has made pitches around that to keep it to just one run. Had a five pitch third, now Colby Halter. Ball one. You see some frustration now, maybe for the first time that we've seen visibly from Coe. And here comes pitching coach Josh McDonald. Yeah, Josh McDonald, you know, senses that early. It's, it's just the command, right? Getting back to being able to repeat the delivery. And you mentioned it, getting around traffic in that second inning, just limiting Florida to one run, that should give him motivation to continue to attack the zone, right? He's only given up the one hit, so make Florida prove that they can hit your stuff. 
One thing Josh McDonald said to us is he's going to be the guy that, say he runs into trouble, bases loaded Walker. The example that Josh McDonald gave was a three-run home run. He's still going to fight his way through it. His thought would be it is what it is. Well, that's Zach Fogel that threw 70-plus pitches on Friday. Get loose, their best reliever. As Colby Halter lifts this to left, and Morton is there for the first down. And a lot of that conversation, too, with that mound visit is, hey, we're at the bottom part of the lineup. You have to attack the zone. We can't mess around with the bottom third of the lineup. These are the guys that you have the opportunity to get the weakest contact from. Shellnut, Halter, Evans, those guys all the few batting under 300 in this lineup. This is Evans in the ninth spot. Back into the starting lineup for Kevin O'Sullivan today. Struck out swinging on a changeup his first time. Upstairs. And conversely, Florida's looking at it as an opportunity, like let's get these guys in the lower part of the lineup on base for the big bangers at the top. He stuck with Evans for a while this season and now getting a chance again here in the postseason. Garrett Coe's trying to bear down. One out, one on, fourth inning. Expecting some action? No, not necessarily, but just got to keep them close. You don't want to get in a rhythm as a pitcher to where you're just going home and going at the same time, right? You don't want to get predictable because then that's when you get an opportunity for a stolen base. Quick work in the third. Coe's fallen behind 2-0 six different times so far today. 3-0 now. And when he falls behind, it's just that arm side, right? Missing arm side location. Arm side again, four pitch walk, second of the inning, fifth of the game. And how long is the leash? He can bounce back from stuff like this, but you've got Zach Fogel, your star reliever, getting loose. Back to the top, third time through, now Cade Curlin. He's walked each of his first two trips. Down. He's trying to find it, he's just pressing it right now, trying to get back on the inner half of the plate. Twenty-five strikes of 58 pitches from Ko. This is a comebacker. Stings Ko and he goes down. They are loaded. 108 right back at Ko and hopefully he's all right. got smoked. Trainer Katie Dan is out to check on the big left-hander. Yeah, really unfortunate there that the comebacker came obviously right back at him. Couldn't tell if it got him on the lower back or the leg there, but either way, you mentioned the velocity off the bat, 107. Off 
the upper left leg. didn't know where the ball was or just it hurt so bad that it was just no reaction towards going and getting the ball. He went down immediately. And he's still kind of hanging over. You feel for Garrett Coe getting the opportunity to pitch on this stage against the number overall number two overall team in the country and he's got to exit in a ton of pain co departs one one hour score they're loaded for langford when we come back a of pain after getting scorched with that comebacker off the bat of cade curland and now he exits with the bases loaded in a 1-1 elimination game in the bottom of the fourth. And Will Nowak comes in, native of South Windsor, Connecticut. And yeah, Nowak's going to come at it with the fastball, curveball, slider combination. He used the fastball most of the time. Not a lot of innings this year so far, but called in a big moment here. Trying to get a ground ball. Biggest thing is get something on the ground if you can from Langford. See if you can induce a double play. Wyatt Langford came up with the bases loaded his last time in the second. You were mighty impressed with his AB. And he worked the bases loaded walk. He's got him loaded again here in the fourth. This time with one, not two outs. First pitch swinging in the air to right center field, and Studley runs it down. Shellnut scores, and the Gators lead on a Wyatt Langford sack fly on the first pitch. Really good at bat, obviously, there from Langford. Just looking for one pitch to be able to drive. They're able to get one. A little surprised that Evans wasn't able to tag there from second base. That ball was driven so deep to right field. I think he had gotten off a little bit too much thinking that, he, that it might have been hit better than it was. Yeah, so he stays in second here. And it'll be a one pitch outing for Will Nowak. Zach Fogel comes in with the lefty Jack Caglione two up. And Will Nowak uh, probably Laughing about a hard day's work <laughs> with his teammates as he strides off. Well, credit Langford for being ready there in that situation. As far as base running goes, these are important situations, though, because in that situation with bases loaded, a ball driven way deep to right center, it's one tag, all tag. So you're looking at the third bait, the, the guy on third, and if he's tagging, everybody else should be tagging. Check out Evans on second. He's getting way too far off. And the same thing with, with Kirtland at first. Those guys could have both tagged. At least Evans should have been able to tag. One tag, all tag, meaning if the guy in front of you is tagging, then you yes. guys all are. Yes. And that ball's in front of Kirtland, who's base running at first. So he can tell, OK, I can try to tag, but that ball's in front of me, so I can know if, if the throw is strong enough, I can go back to first. I have enough time. But Evans got to be tagging there. Well, we got a moment. NCAA regional coverage for all 16 sites continues tomorrow on ESPN Plus and on the ESPN app. For more info, visit NCAA.com, the home for all 90 NCAA championships. So. Zach Fogel, the first team Big East reliever, is in. Top five in the country in appearances. He has now matched the program record 
set by Caleb Worcester four years ago with appearance number 36, and he's in after he threw three and two-thirds innings of shutout ball against Texas Tech, but threw 76 pitches two days ago. Yeah, he's a lefty that can get up to 95. He'll settle in usually around 90, 92. Has a good slider. Changeup can be tough to hit at times. Has really late life to the fastball. That's one of the things that's given him a lot of success this year so far. And he's been pitching with confidence. You mentioned it. This is a guy that they're not afraid to bring out of that bullpen anytime in a high leverage situation. He's got to face this guy. Jack Caglione, second in the country with the 29 home runs. And like his last trip in the second, he's got runners aboard. And the base is loaded when he flew out to center. Came off his bat at 111 miles an hour. One for 10 in this regional. And now facing Fogel. The splits for Caglione. Fogel's been dynamite against left-hand hitters this year. First pitch swinging, Caglione to right center field, to the wall, and gone! Number 30. Caglione just sat on it. That's all he did, he sat on the slider right there. He's been seeing pitches well, especially after the first game. You could tell he's been allowing the ball to travel a little bit more, seeing the off speed. He knows they're gonna try to mix and match and try to get him off balance. First pitch slider, he bangs that thing out of the yard. 109 off the bat and it traveled 446 feet on the first pitch he saw from Zach Fogle. zone with a 1-0 to Josh Rivera. And that's just sticking to the scouting report, right? Understanding you're going to see a lot of sliders, especially as a lefty, left-on-left -left situation. I wake back, I let the ball get deep, and I do what I do. Seven runs in two games. Then three runs on one swing. I don't know if it's grip or Something with the mound for Zach Fogel right now, but two big, big misses here. Three one. Sales. Mike, let's take a trip back. Because this ball was absolutely exploded off the bat of Jack Caglione. Look at the setup, get the foot down, backside rotated, and that ball's demolished. Look where this thing lands. Trying to get out there and get a snow cone that ball was. Brings up BT Riopelle. Two outs, one on. Think about the three pitch sequence from UConn pitching. Three different pitchers. Comebacker 108 off the left hip or backside for Co. Sack fly against Will Nowak. Three run home run from Caglione against Fogel. Three pitches from three different pitchers, and this game has changed suddenly. Nothing at two on Riapel. And one thing that we can't be reluctant to mention is Florida taking advantage of some walks, right? Yep. Understanding that UConn has now walked six batters in this game and taken to that advantage this inning specifically and letting the power come into play. Jim Penders has a saying that he repeats all the time to his pitchers. Solo shots don't lose ball games. It's when you put guys on in front of that that'll lose you games. And yesterday was only solo shots from Florida A&M. Today, here in the fourth, a big swing and a three-run tank from Caglione.
Hard not to think, too, about some of the misfortune for UConn pitching. They're here practicing the day before the regional starts, and one of their starting pitchers, Andrew Sears, gets diagnosed with mono, gets taken to urgent care. And then Garrett Coe takes a comebacker off the leg and has to leave. And then Jack Caglione did this. Yeah, so good. We got to show it to you twice. Look at the emotion coming off of Jack Caglione. Jack Caglione, he's juiced. The team is juiced. That's a big homer in a big spot. Leon just hit a three-run home run, his 30th of this magical season. He's only the third player in SEC history to hit 30 in a season. Nobody had done it since 2000. And Jack Caglione back into a tie, as we showed you, for the nation's lead in home runs with Cam Fisher of Charlotte. Got scalding hot before regionals. And has 30 as well. Charlotte and Clemson doing battle right now. This is pulled by Corey Morton to left and deep, but Tyler Shellnut's there for the first out in the fifth for Hurston Waldrop. And Coach Penders is clapping over there at the third base box. He's, you just have to keep having good at bats, right? Remember, this is a team that has a lot of power within themselves. They've had a great offensive season. UConn just has to string together good at bats here. You can't think so much about the score and being down four runs. You still have a lot of game left to scratch runs. Good curveball to start out David Smith. He's had a couple good plate appearances today, to your point. A walk in the first. And a run scoring single in the third to get the Huskies on the board and tie the game at the time at one. Walter bets 60 pitches through four and a third. Oh, two. Nasty splitter. That thing is disgusting. And I talk about str stringing together good at bats. Easier said than done against one of the best pitchers in the nation. And it gets one of the best swing and miss pitches in the nation when you talk about that split finger. Brings up Paul Tamaro. We asked BT Rypel, Florida catcher, what's the best secondary that Waldrop's got? He said, oh, it's got to be the splitter. When it's on, oh my gosh. He said, I'm just a hockey goalie. I'm not even trying to receive it. I'm just trying to keep it in front of me because I know it's going to be swing and miss. Waldrop cruising, 0-2. Look out. Well, I think the thing that's most impressive to me about the split finger is the fact that he has the type of control that you don't normally see college pitchers have with it, especially with that type of velocity. Normally comes in around 88, 89, and to think that it's that hard but have control to both sides of the plate with it is impressive. Swing and miss. The hockey goalie caps the K. That's a shutdown inning, and Hurston Waldrip is starting to feel it. Fiery in the fifth. One fourth inning. To the bottom of the fifth. So 5-1 is the Florida lead in this elimination game. Gators and Huskies. Zach Fogel dots 90 for strike one. To Luke Heyman, DH who doubled his first time, six, seven, and eight. What's the path back if you're UConn? You said zeros, you got to string yeah. together good at bats, and then is zeros from a pitching standpoint. Just trying to get the guys back into the dugout as quickly as possible, right? You can build momentum on the defensive side by getting in rhythm, having a good pace, keeping guys off the bases, get the guys back up into the bats, using the bats as quickly as possible. And as you've said, they've got to avoid the free passes. Strike three calls on the edge from Fogel. Back-to-back Ks. It's just about, like, from a defensive side and a pitching side, keeping your guys on their toes, right? You don't want it to lull and 
and kind of get slow out there to where you are giving, getting deep in the counts and giving those free passes. You want to keep guys energetic. Hey, we, we're still rolling. We're still in this. Trying to forge a road back. Tyler Shelnut's got one of the six Florida walks as an offense. Slices this one down the line and right, and that's a fair ball into the corner. Studley collects, Shelnut coasts, one out double. And if you're a Gator supporter, gotta love this swing from Shelnut. Just a lean you to the right side. Great load, hips clear. And that's a rocket to the right, opposite field. Brings up Colby Halter. Hit by a pitch in the second, flew to left in the fourth. Squares and bunts in the fifth. Freeberger bare hands and makes the play. Sack successful. Tom Freeberg has made some nice defensive plays. I think it was more trying to bunt for a base okay, hit yeah. in the situa situation with Freeberger was actually maybe a step or two behind the base, but Freeberger coming in quick. That's one thing we've seen a lot of. First pitch swinging Ty Evans. A run scoring single, he strokes into right and adds to the Gator lead with his first hit since April 11th. And the bats are really starting to wake up now. We talked about it early in this one, the approach of being able to use the opposite field, being able to think line drive. Coach O'Sullivan talked about it during the interview, trying to keep the ball out of the air. You're starting to backspin some baseballs. Fourth time through the lineup now with Cade Curlin. And now you get to that point, it's, it's still only a five run game. But if you're the Gators and you can add on even more offense in the next couple of innings, you can maybe use arms that you'd be more interested in using should you win this game and get to another elimination game tonight. Right. Still a long way to go. That is not to count out UConn by any means. But you're kind of starting to think about that with a five run margin right now. Man, pitch count's still very manageable for Hurston Waldrop at 65 through five. Stroke to left and Morton makes the catch. 106 off Cade Curlin's bat. He's been scalding some balls. 6 1 through 5, Gators. I'm going to show you some of this nastiness right here. This thing just dives right off of the table. It's been swinging Miss Central all day off of this pitch. And you got to give him a lot of credit because he's been spotting it up, putting it down in places where the UConn hitters have not been able to touch it today. And he's back out for the sixth with the pitch count, like we said, manageable. Six one is his lead. Dom Freeberger, two and zero, oh. uh, the three hitter for the Huskies. A line out to right and a strikeout on that splitter. You talked about the secondaries three-pitch mix of secondaries that is an MLB power mix to go along with the fastball that we've seen upper 90s. Ooh, called the strike three and one. And I think that's why, you know, obviously there's so much discussion about him being a top draft pick is because the arsenal is already ready. Chopper to third, foul. Full count on Freeberg. And 
another thing that impresses me with Waldrip is as the game has progressed, he's been continuing to be sharper. A lot of times you'll see some stuff kind of flatten out a little bit as far as the secondary stuff. Maybe the split floats in every now and then. No, it still had the same sharpness to it since pitch number one. Preseason first team All-American, pitching like it today. Just off the edge. Freeberger walks and the leadoff man on for the Huskies and Walter not pleased. It's a good spot right there. Tough pitch to take, but Freeberger's been having some good at-bats. He understands the strike zone, staying away from that pitch on the inner half. He's able to start something in the six for UConn. Crowd didn't like it. It did look like it was off. You think? A little tight. He's been throwing so good, you want that pitch because he's been spotting up. Now Ben Huber with a man on and no one out. Single to center his last time. It's a ball and a strike on the native of Pendleton, South Carolina, the albino rhino. We asked him post game about the nickname, which he's been hearing about, of course, for two years. Came from his head coach originally in the fall when he saw Ben running. And then reappeared last year when he absolutely hammered a home run against USC. It went like 480. Took off from there, Ben said. He's had a lot of fun with it. He enjoys that his teammates do as well. Lays off the splitter. I'm not calling Ben anything outside of his name. <laughs> He's one of those guys I'm not messing with. His teammates loved it because at the time, the Hispanic Titanic was the nickname around college baseball for Ivan Melendez, the Texas slugger. Won the Golden Spikes Award with his home run binge last season. Huber's got some juice, too. 3-2 on the ground, left field, base hit, first two on for the Huskies in the sixth. And that's a quality at bat right there. Waldrip kept trying to come in on the inner half of the plate. Huber fouled a couple off. We talk about the exit below of Ben Huber, 113 off the bat. He's got so many exit velos like that. We saw the bullpen, Nick Ficarota and Blake Purnell for the Gators. This is the other side of what we were talking about last inning. Can you add to the lead and avoid using up other arms? But also, can Waldrop get you length? And UConn, certainly an offense more than capable of inserting themselves into that discussion as well. Well, we've seen it all season long with UConn. They, they continue to fight. This is not a team that's going to lay down. Strike one with a fastball to Jake Studley. This guy epitomizes that identity. Hard nose. Nothing and two on Studley, the son of a retired state trooper in Rhode Island who Jim Penders told us. Jake Studley sometimes squeezes the bat and is so intense, it feels like the bat's gonna turn to metal shavings. Staring down an 0-2 from Waldrop. Stays alive. You said it right after the four run inning, UConn had to string together quality at bats. With the clock ticking, down by five now. Trying to do that here in the sixth. 0-2, oh, Studley lays off. And the reason why I say that is because it's, it's easy to put pressure on yourself and say, I gotta be the guy, right? I gotta be the one to hit the three-run home or no. 
pass the baton, keep having good at bats, set the tone for not just now, but throughout the rest of the game. Pulled down the line and foul. A UConn team with 44 wins this season, ranked ninth in the D1 Baseball Top 25. Big East regular season champs. One, two. Studley takes strike three called. One away, strikeout number eight. Just, that's tough. It's tough to swing at that pitch. This is a split that starts at the top of the zone. It, out of hand, it looks like it's coming like a fastball that's going to end up around eye height. So you're trying to lay off, but then that thing at the last second, that late break down, that running action, it's just nasty. One down, Luke Broadhurst. You were talking about seeing splitter down and sometimes then the fastball exploding up. You're not expecting splitter up. Right. And then a slider to start out Broadhurst. Fanned on a split his last time. And that's just getting a little bigger than you want to if you're Broadhurst. You got to... Coach Penders mentioned it in the interview, right? You got a jab. This is not try to slug at this point. I got a jab. That means short, compact with my swings. 0 2. Back to back K's. Four strikeouts the last two innings as Waldrip tries to bear down. He's got some dog in him. Whatever Coach O'Sullivan mentioned to Waldrip, that got him locked back in in the next two batters. Now he's got to finish if he wants to get out of this inning. He's generated 11 swings and misses today. Ryan Daniels. This one kicks away from Raya Pell, and there's two in scoring position now for Ryan Daniels, the freshman. Daniels came off the bench in a big spot Friday in the seventh, worked the count full. Drove in a run with an RBI ground out. Got a start yesterday, had a leadoff walk in the ninth inning. Now here in the sixth, breaking ball strike. The adjustment right there, he bounced one about 50 feet, and then he came back and spotted him up on the outer half of the plate. And that was 1-1. Daniels laid off the pitch up and no swing on appeal. According to Travis Eggert, two and one. Second and third. And now two and two. Two two pitch. Daniel strikes out. Well, he's pretty good. One. Hey, ESPN is the home for the NCAA College Baseball Regionals, and you can watch Squeeze Play in its first hour of many hours. We hope not as many hours as last night. Scan that QR code below and get access to every game going on all at once. Wyatt Lankford leads off in the bottom of the sixth. Clemson, Tennessee was the headliner last night. Played late into the night at Doug Kingsmore Stadium. The Vols got the win. Cam Canarella got ejected. ACC Freshman of the Year, Clemson center fielder. Langford laces one into the corner and foul. He has been locked in. That came off his bat at a whopping 116. <laughs> It's 
Zach Fogel's 0-2. My favorite Langford thing this weekend was him legging out that infield single in the ninth last night. Yeah, he turned the Jets on. I, I was down there earlier before the game, and the, the size of this dude is something different. Strikes out. The rare expansion of the zone. One away, Jack Caglione now. Well, we told you. Third guy to get 30 in SEC history. Another guy who's large when you see him in person. When you're ahead of Rafael Palmero, you're doing something right. Popped up to second. Daniels, two down. Here's Josh Rivera. Strike from Zach Fogel. Just off the inside edge. On the ground to short. Tamero makes it a one, two, three. Nine pitches for Zach Fogel in the sixth. UConn down five. Caglione to right center field. It gone! Nasty splitter. That thing is disgusting. Yeah, it is. Jack Caglione with number 30, Hurston Waldrop with 10 keys, including three in a row in the sixth. And Florida in a position to try to get to tonight. Loser goes home, winner plays against Texas Tech, and would need to beat the Red Raiders twice, of course, in this double elimination format to get to Super Regionals next weekend. 91 pitches and Hurston Waldrop back out for the seventh. Matt Garbowski, the catcher, leads off 8-9-1 for the Huskies. How about how Walter locked it back in after a leadoff walk, then a single, two on, no one out. And three straight Ks. Honor the first, one away in the seventh. Well, all it took was Coach O'Sullivan going out there and just reminding him what he's capable of doing, right? He also probably told him, look out there in that bullpen. I have a couple guys ready if you're not ready to close this thing out this inning. And he came back one, two, three, wasn't messing around. But we would greatly prefer it if you do get us longer right. into this game. Mm -hmm. Phil Abner on the left and Nick Ficarota on the right. Abner worked last night. Corey Morton's down nothing at two. Then the question becomes, who starts tonight? It's not a question Kevin O'Sullivan expanded on last night. Down, Morton resists. Cade Fisher is the pitcher with the most innings, along with Nick Ficarota, who we have not seen yet from the Gators. Nasty splitter, it's 11 strikeouts for Hurston Waldrop. And you just see he's gotten into a groove, right? It's, it's almost expected to get a swing and miss every time just because it looks like a strike coming out of hand. It looks like a fastball right there. And this is the dip, biggest difference with the split finger is it comes in looking like a fastball. It's hard to really tell the rotation of the baseball is no different than a fastball. And then at the last second, it has that late drop. A strike to David Smith. A walk and an RBI single for the UConn captain. 
Eight of the nine Husky hitters have struck out at least once against this nastiness from Hurston Waldrop. 100 pitches, five in a row set down, four of them via the strikeout. Trying to finish his afternoon with a K. A dozen for number 12. come out of the stretch at Condren Ballpark in Gainesville, Florida, and go to the bottom of the seventh. Number two overall seed, Gators, up 6-1 on the two seed in this regional, the Yukon Huskies. 21 on BT Ryapel, 5-6-7 for Florida against Zach Fogel. Ryapel off the end of the bat. Flares it at Tamara. One away. What a performance by Hurston Walter. Seven innings, 101 pitches, a dozen strikeouts. Yeah, we highlighted so much of the swing and miss before the game even started, and it was something we expected to see. And really, he's been so good and efficient with all of his stuff. It, it, it's impressive. If he's done, then he had an amazing day. Backs against the wall for the Florida Gators, and Hurston Waldrip has stepped up. Right-handed action in the Gators' pen. Meanwhile, for UConn, Zach Fogel will depart as Jim Penders tries to manage this down by five. We welcome you up here to the broadcast booth, Xavier Scruggs, Mike Monaco with you, and we started the day talking about lose, they go home. And for Florida in this matchup, they have managed that as really well as you could hope. A big home run from Caglione and a starting pitcher who could be a first round pick stepped up. Yeah, everything came together today. When you talk about the pitching, when you talk about from a power standpoint, and it's something we've seen all season long, but I look at specifically, your big dogs have to step up in these types of games. And the big dog's been eating. And I think when you come into an elimination game and you're a team that's hosting a regional, there can be extra pressure on you, but at the same time, you have to remember, we got ourselves in this position so we can be able to host. Like, we are expected to come out of this. And you have to remind yourself sometimes as a team how good you are, and now we're starting to see that again. After the loss last night against Texas Tech, there was just one heck of a ball game. A Red Raiders win 5-4. When Tech got two in the bottom of the eighth to break the 3-3 tie on that Gavin Cash home run, and then Kevin O'Sullivan's team made that interesting in the ninth inning. All right, so Brady Aftham enters now. Native of Maine who comes on. He can spin it as well like Will Nowak, who was in for one pitch and one batter earlier. Comes on with one out here with a couple of righties due for Florida in the seventh. Yeah, and his job is just to you know continue to give them an opportunity to let the defense work, right? See 17 walks in 24 innings. That's the one thing that kind of sticks out is making sure that the command is on point and not allowing any more freebies for a team like Florida who's already taken advantage of a lot of walks today on the UConn side. Rappel popped to short. Base is empty, one down, Luke Hame. Doubled in the second. Grounded out in the third. Struck out looking in the fifth. By the way, peeking ahead for Texas Tech. It sounded like post game last night that Tim Tadlock was leaning toward Zane Petty to pitch for the Red Raiders tonight. Petty, a freshman, Texas native, he's made 10 starts this year. They thought it was possible he could 
go out of the bullpen this weekend as well. But very well could be the starter for the Red Raiders. And who is it if Florida is indeed playing in that game tonight? Hammond to third, Freeburger, two down. An interesting guy would be Brandon Neely to consider. Of course, the Florida closer, first team All-SEC. He's only thrown 10 pitches this weekend. That was Friday in their regional opener, scoreless ninth inning against Florida A&M. And of course, last year, starting pitching experience and well-rested. There's Tyler Shelnut. 93 for ball one. And then if you win tonight, speaking of really getting ahead of ourselves, you got to play again tomorrow too. One one. Back up breaking ball called a strike. Aftham is one two. Yanked. Two two. Shellnut pulls it. Left field base hit. Two hits plus a walk for Tyler Shellnut. Two out knock here in the seventh. Yeah, I think that's been one of the differences too. Is also you look at the bottom third of this order has provided opportunities for these guys to get on base. Shellnut two for three on the day. Evans one for two already. Halter having some decent at-bats, got hit by a pitch, then had a sacrifice in the fifth. Shelner gets run for by Michael Robertson. Ty Evans got a start in Robertson's stead here today. Now Colby Halter. Hit by a pitch in the second. A bunt probably for a hit. He was trying to do in the fifth. Pops one up, foul. Yeah, we came in talking about the Gators offense. And just seven runs the first two games. And a half dozen in this one. Elimination games going on across the country here. In this early window of action on this Sunday afternoon. as many walks in this one as they had the first two. Yeah, and they've taken advantage of the walks. That's the thing is, you know, not necessarily a huge breakout day from a hitting standpoint, but just, okay, we've got some guys on in front of some of our bigger guys, especially Jack Caglione. Like, you, you take advantage of those things. It's the timely hitting. You hear it all the time when we talk about offense, getting those timely hits. Robertson goes, cut on and miss. The throw from Garbowski does not get him. And I got it. You got to love continuing to put pressure on, right? As an offense, you want to find ways to say, hey, we're not settling for what we already have. Let's find ways to continue to make some things happen. O2 to Halter. That ends the inning. UConn is down by five. They've got six outs left to play with. Regionals presented by Capital One. 
Backs against the wall for both these teams here today. UConn had already won one elimination game. Trailing in their second, Florida trying to force another game against Texas Tech. Red Raiders waiting for tonight. Eighth inning, Hurston Waldrop is done after seven innings, 12 Ks, and Nick Ficarota enters. Yeah, Ficarota, righty, you'll see the fastball slider change up. Fastball uses about 47% of the time. Slider 27%, change up 26%. So we'll mix in both those off speed pitches about equally. Looks to get ground balls. Redshirt sophomore from Palm Harbor, Florida. Starts off speed for strike one to Paul Tamaro. Six outs left to play with, like we said, for UConn. Drop down slot and that serve foul. Tamaro for three, a pop to second, and then two of the 12 strikeouts. Generated by Hurston Walter against Jim Pender's group offensively. And over the top, that misses. Tamaro will be back next year. Should factor heavily into the Huskies' mix. He'll be a sixth year player. Strikes out looking. One away. Great sign for Florida to see some relief arms come out, attacking the zone immediately for Figueroa. Bullpen's been great, like we've talked about this weekend down the stretch for Florida. Kevin O'Sullivan said it has come together in the second half. Now Dom Freeberger trying to stop a stretch during which six of the last seven Husky hitters have punched out. Wind ripping through. That's a strike, two and one. Two and two on Freeburger. Freeburger was a four-year starter at UNC Asheville. Each of the last couple of seasons was all-conference first team in the Big South. And then went off and found a bigger program. Pledged to the Huskies before his final year even started at UNC Asheville. And the type of guy that didn't want his UNC Asheville teammates to think that his focus was anywhere but with them. So he kept it quiet. Only a few of his closest friends knew. Himself, obviously, family, the UConn coaches. Now here with the Huskies. Full count on them. Three, two. Freeburger bounces it softly to Halter. And Freeburger's on. For the second time in his many trips, and a one-out base runner for the Huskies, down five with five outs left. And as you count down some of these outs as an offense, you're just trying to continue to have some good at-bats, get some guys on base. Try to have those quality at-bats and don't feel like, got to hit the big home run, right? Just getting on base, finding little ways to see more pitches, let the count get a little bit deeper. You love having this guy up, Ben Huber. Two singles his last two times after loud contact like we've talked about for a couple of his hits yesterday. NCAA regional coverage for all 16 sites continues tomorrow on ESPN Plus and on the ESPN app. For more information, visit NCAA.com, the home for all 90 NCAA championships. Tyler Nesbitt has a 2.95 ERA in a little over 20 innings this year. And he's getting loose.
Ficarota got roughed up his last time against Vandy. In the game that knocked out the Gators in Hoover at the SEC tournament. Four runs, four outs he got. Gave up seven hits. Hadn't pitched in three weeks. And now on in here in the eighth inning. Two one to Huber. Here's a strike. One of the best bats the Huskies have. Two two. Inside, what a take and the full count. Figueroa almost tried to quick pitch him a little bit there. Came set, click, and fire that thing. Nice job of Huber being able to see that all the way for a ball. Payoff. Huskies just trying to grit their teeth with these hit bats. Yeah, all while Figueroa is trying to get that ground ball double play. I mentioned always trying to work for a ground ball, has that running action on his fastball to look to get to a rollover. With the stuff and from that slot too. That leads to that. Eighth pitch of the plate appearance. This is quintessential Husky offense. Kind of the epitome of their program too. Hard nose. They ooze toughness as a Northeast team. And not going down without a battle here. Ninth pitch. Huber pulls it over Rivera in the left center. Two on with one out. And UConn threatening again, this time in the eighth inning. And it just seemed to be one of those at bats that could provide some momentum for UConn. A real battle right there. Nick Figueroa kept trying to come on the inner half of the plate. Huber recognizing that, fouling a couple off, and then being able to get the barrel finally to that 3 2 pitch and drive it into the outfield. 20 pitches for Figueroa. Tyler Nesbitt was up. And Picarota will stay in. I mean, the formula is going to be the same, too. Still trying to get look for that ground ball double play. Try to see if you get Studley to roll something over to third or shortstop. For Studley, I have to recognize that, too, though. This is a guy that's good with his arm angle is going to be running it in on me. I've got to keep the ball elevated a little bit, try to get something a little more up in the zone that I can kind of get underneath, be able to drive to the outfield. Jake Studley now, one for 10 this weekend. That is Brandon Neal. All SEC closer. You are praying you don't need to use him in any capacity in this game. On the ground to third, and Halter gets one, and that's it. They give the out to Curlin, the force on Huber. Two down, UConn's got him at the corners. Good look. Definitely on the transfer. Ball came out on the transfer. Nice job for Figueroa getting that ground ball he needed right there. Didn't get two, but he'll certainly take that ground ball 
And now number two. Now Luke Broadhurst, one for 11 this weekend. The fifth year senior from Stafford Springs, Connecticut. Pulls one to left and drops it down. In front of Wyatt Langford to score Freeburger. And this game tightens to 6-2 here in the eighth inning. You gotta love Broadhurst being ready for the slider. Says to himself, if I get something to where I can get extended a little bit, be able to drive something toward the outfield, especially with him being one for 11, you're trying to get a good pitch to be able to get some good barrel on. That's a nice swing right there to extend the inning. Two on, with still the two out for Ryan Daniels, who pushes a bunt foul up along third. Wheels turn for Kevin O'Sullivan. Navigating the pitching here in the late innings. Ryan Daniels is one for three, singled in the fourth. And he's down nothing and two against Ficarota. And this at bat is so important for Florida, obviously for UConn too. You get Daniels on, you're looking at a situation where you're bringing the tie and run up to the plate. Then you really got to think about Neal. 0 oh, 2. Daniel strikes out. Ficarota bears down, leaves two. The Gators' lead is four in the eighth. It's on three run over. Ball absolutely demolished the right center. The home runs keep coming for Jack Caglione. 30 of them, not bad. Ty Evans leads off in the bottom of the eighth. 6-2 is the Gators' lead. Trying to get two tonight, play another ball game, and save a season for a few more hours at a minimum. Ball and a strike on Evans, who walked in the fourth. RBI single to the backside in the fifth. You would expect him to be right back in the lineup if Florida does hang out here. Two and two. Florida team trying to get to Supers for the first time since 2018, that Omaha team. The year following, of course, the national title. Full count. Yeah, obviously still work to be done for Florida today, but you got to look at, they still haven't had their best at bats yet. They, they would tell you that they can still build off a of momentum for an offense going into another game if they get that opportunity. Lead off walk, Evans aboard for a third time. And now what they have done is had a better approach at the plate, mm -hmm. being able to work some walks, hitting better with the runners in scoring position, putting pressure on the defense. All those things amount to having better days at the plate and being able to put up some more runs. Richie Sheikoffer runs for Kevin O'Sullivan. Yeah, that's kind of scary to think about, right, if you're Texas Tech. Obviously, the Red Raiders pitch so well these first couple of games. But those bats are still kind of lurking for Florida, which, as you said off the top, came in averaging 8.3 runs per game, which is a very good clip. Texas Tech, of course, great offense themselves. And these two heavyweights exchanged some haymakers last night. Here's Cade Curlin. You'd be hard pressed to find just a better game, sheer entertainment across nine innings than what we saw last night in this entire tournament. Curlin skies this left center at Smith. 
for the first down. Game last night didn't have any of that wild swings or massive comebacks like we've seen elsewhere in the country. We didn't play extras. We didn't have a grand slam at 1.53 a.m. like they did in Winston-Salem, but that was pretty great last night. It was like you're sitting on the edge of your seat. Yeah. And you knew a big blow was going to come at some point. Luckily for Texas Tech, came a couple times from Gavin Cash. Wyatt Langford takes a strike. Bases loaded, walk in the second, sack fly in the fourth. Fly out and a strikeout as well. Brady aft them with a very long hold. Up high. Now how about Gavin Cash? I mean, he's one of those guys. We talk a lot about Langford and how short, compact his swing is with a big power punch. The same can be said for Gavin Cash. Two home runs yesterday, 26 total. Before those home runs, he'd been 0 for 19. Got dropped down to seventh in the lineup. Told this postgame, doesn't matter where I hit in the lineup. Maybe that was a silly question by a certain play-by-play -play announcer. Lankford strikes it well. Center field, Smith roams and slides to make the catch. Two down. Right, that ball was struck to right center. The wind is just changing directions. That was 106 off the bat. We talk a lot about, you know, the juice that Langford has. The wind has knocked some balls down here for both teams. Feels like Wyatt Langford has been so close to having a monster weekend with some of the contact he's made. Back to the pen for Jim Penders with two outs in the eighth, trying to keep this at four. ESPN is the home for the NCAA College Baseball Regionals, and you can watch Squeeze play, and why wouldn't you? Between games that we have going on here at this Gainesville Regional, scan that QR code and check out all the action from around the country. Right now, Charlotte has a lead against Clemson, the number four overall national seed in the seventh inning in that elimination game. Tigers had to play extras last night against Tennessee. And then back at it early on today. Braden Quinn in, the lefty to face Jack Caglione, and he hammers one. This might go over the scoreboard. Oh, man, from Caglione, 31. We've been talking about it all weekend long. The power of Jack Caglione has already done it today but just continues to swing the bat the way he's been doing it all season long. 31 home runs this season. You see it leads D1. Just absolutely ridiculous what this man is doing at the plate. That was majestic. It's now the second time that he has homered on the first pitch he's seen in this game from a left-handed reliever. It's it, just like when you see the trajectory of how he's hitting them, when you say majestic, that's the perfect explanation just because of the way it's coming off the bat. And he's got such juice, you know if he gets it at the right launch angle, that ball is put in the orbit. Josh Rivera bounces it to short. Paul Tamaro ends the inning. Felt like Jack Caglione was going to hit his own headshot on the scoreboard and right. Look at him. Look at him. That man is on a mission right now. The 
check this out. My man coming around third. Look, 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 Jordan shrug. Just like, I don't know what happened. It just happened. Jack Caglione has 31 home runs. There is only one player in SEC history who's hit more in a season. Breaking news, he's good at baseball. Just unreal. Did you ever have 31 in a season? Never. The only time I had over 30 was overseas. I don't even think that counts. Oh, come on. That counts. <laughs> this is T.C. Simmons. He's a fifth-year senior getting a pinch hit opportunity here. Yeah, this is a nice touch from Jim Penders. T.C. Simmons, a starter for a big chunk of this season. Opening day center fielder in the heart of the lineup. He missed 31 games with a broken hand. He had missed time in the fall due to injury as well. Came back in late April. He's a really good defensive outfielder. Last year a starter as well. Got on base a ton. And gets a chance here to bat in the ninth inning with UConn staring down elimination. Began his career in junior college in California. 2-2 from Nick Ficarota. This UConn program is mighty impressive year after year. Talk to opposing head coaches. They have so much respect for what the Huskies do and the way this program is run. Simmons strikes out. Two outs left for UConn. Yet again, they were Big East regular season champs. And Jim Penders once again got his team to regionals for a fifth straight time. He's been to two Supers and nine regionals as the head man at his alma mater. And yesterday, he hit 700 career wins. Corey Morton. Got the good two. Uh, to Morton, junior who is draft eligible. He's got good tools, speed and power. Perhaps his final AB. When you talk about, you know, talking to opposing coaches, I just think about talking to Coach Penders and, and some of the players, and there's an expectation here. Not just from a performance standpoint, but from a foundation, right, and just an integrity. And that's what you love to see from UConn. They've continued to battle all season long. They're one of those teams that they will fight no matter what happens within the game. They do not give in. And they've had an impressive season so far up until this point. Jim's father is here, also named Jim. We had a chance to meet him this weekend. Strikeout, two down. Coach Pender's father, a recently retired high school baseball coach for more than 40 years in Connecticut. Played on the Huskies' 1965 College World Series team. There are members of the 1979 team that went to the College World Series here. We heard from folks around the Huskies program reaching out to share the lineage of this UConn program. Now down to its final out against Florida. This is their captain, David Smith. Jim Penders thinks he's got a future in pro ball as well with a good speed. Fourth year junior. They ran into some misfortune with their pitching. Kind of felt like that, their coaching staff said all season. And then got the number two seed here today. And the Gators trying to move on to tonight. Two balls and two strikes on Smith. And who will be on the bump for Florida? Is it Brandon Neely? Texas Tech has confirmed they're throwing Zane Petty. 16 strikeouts from Florida pitching today. 
And two home runs from Jack Caglione. Smith stays alive. Ficarota deals. Quintessential way for UConn to keep battling. It's a program that is right there with the likes of Coastal Carolina, East Carolina, Dallas Baptist, those non-power conference teams that are heavyweights. The hook C down to its final strike. We'll see you tonight. And Mike, really, you got to look at some of the themes from today, Waldrop set the tone, right? You talk about the strikeouts, the split finger working today, the elite stuff, took advantage of knocking out Garrett Cole early in this one and then took advantage of timely hits. Guys on base, guys in scoring position. Jack Caglione, the two homers today, but also pitching around traffic. Guys, got pitchers coming in doing what they need to do from a relief standpoint. They took care of business in this one. They sure did an 8-2 win to get to game six at this regional. Texas Tech with a win heads to Supers. Should the Gators win, they force a game seven winner take all tomorrow, just like Florida had last year. This game will start at six o'clock Eastern time, five o'clock Lubbock time. We will let you know what television channel it is on as soon as we have that information. The Gators stay alive. Jack Caglione is with us. Jack, how'd you guys do this today to keep fighting and extend your season? You know, one of the biggest things we had to work on was really just getting the bats hot. And I think today was definitely that day. Um, you know, we finally got the job done and hopefully we can take it into Tennessee Tech or Texas Tech, my bad. Um, tonight and take it into Monday. Jack, talk to us a little bit about the job that Hurston Waldrep did today. I felt like he set the tone from a starting pitching standpoint. Yeah, I mean, Hurston really stepped up today. You know, we needed a big outing out of him, and, you know, he rose to the challenge. Jack, twice you saw a lefty come in, and on the first pitch, you homered. What was your plan? Really just kind of keep that front foot a little bit more open than against a righty, and you know, it worked out to my favor today. Now, Jack, the first home run went to go get a snow cone. That ball went to get a snow cone. The second one almost hit the scoreboard. Which one was better for you today? I probably got more of the first one, honestly. Um, <laughs> after I hit the second one, I looked towards the dugout. Everyone was still watching it because, you know, it was kind of a wall scraper with the way this wind's blowing in. So I was, you know, thankful it got out. It didn't look like a fool. Jack, last <laughs> thing here. What do you do between games? Get some food and... Keep our minds right going into tonight. All right, man, get to it. Thanks Appreciate for the time. You, Thank you all. Yeah, he'll take the first one. Uh, second one was pretty good, too. And uh, let's hope this is just a precautionary tarp on the field here in Gainesville. For Xavier Scruggs and our entire crew, led by Sean Jackson and Scott Snyder, the excellent gang behind the scenes. I'm Mike Monaco saying so long. Come on back at 6 o'clock Eastern time.